We are in a series in the New Testament book of Acts, and we find ourselves today in Acts 15. The first missionary journey of Paul is in the books, as we left off last Sunday, the celebration of Paul and Barnabas' return to Antioch in the conclusion of chapter 14. Chapter 15 stands as a uh, much-needed housekeeping moment in the early church. It's a very practical moment that reminds you just how real the Bible is. To go from the absolute celebration high of Paul's missionary journeys back to a church business meeting where people are arguing over doctrine in Jerusalem. You see, the gospel had been going out in all directions, certainly with a new level of outreach to uh, the, the known world with Paul and Barnabas. Christ was proclaimed to Jew and Gentile for perhaps 15 years after the resurrection at this point, and we learn in Acts 15, there's actually been two versions of the gospel that have uh, been going out. This is not to say that there are two Gospels, for there is one Gospel, but that the Gospel was presented in two different packages. One version said, you must have faith alone in Christ crucified and resurrected to be saved, and then, as a result of that, you will seek to live a holy life. The other said, you must have faith in Christ while also adopting the laws of Moses, and not just the moral components, but the civil components, such as circumcision, alongside faith in order to be saved. One group said that you need only to believe in Christ by faith and obey him as honoring to God. The other group said, no matter your previously pagan background or culture, you must practically become a messianic Jew to become a Christian. And so Acts 15 is an early debate. Does a Gentile convert have to walk through the door of Judaism in order to walk into Christianity? Should all Christians in all times, in all places, become Messianic Jews, including you here today? That was on the table in Acts 15, a tough business meeting in the church, two sides presenting their arguments. And there will be a clear-cut winner in today's story, as I hope you already know, but we will see in the debate the apostles' main concern is one that we should have at all times, that these additions to the gospel, which were, I think, intended to help people, I think that was their intent, to help people live holy lives, these additions actually end up hurting the gospel by obscuring grace. There were those who thought that they were helping by adding additional commandments and requirements to be saved, but in reality, they actually were hurting. So I wanna show you four truths today affirmed by the Jerusalem Council in a message titled, When Helping Hurts. So let's pray before we look at God's Word. Lord, again, we come to you asking and begging you to do a work in our hearts today through the proclamation of your Word. We know that your Word is power, Lord, because you are power. And so, Father, as we study this text, I pray that you would just illuminate it to the person that needs the message of grace today. Lord, I specifically pray uh, for the one here who has been doing this in their own way in life, seeking to earn favor from you by doing and keeping, uh, and God, that you would just let amazing grace overcome somebody today. In Jesus' name, amen. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts 15 if you haven't. Last week, again, we left Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, a city hundreds of miles north of Jerusalem. And uh, really, there had become two centers, two hubs of Christianity at this time. There was the Antioch hub, and that was more your Gentile flavor. And there was the Jerusalem hub, and that was more of your Jewish flavor. So they had um, completed the missionary journey, number one, sharing the gospel to the Gentiles all over Galatia. They're in the middle of celebrating. Man, look at all God did when we went to Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, and they're just enjoying the works and the fruits that God gave them. And so here we see another tactic of Satan on display. Right in the middle of your celebration of God's victories comes a negative Nancy, a Debbie Downer, a Mr. Wet Blanket. Uh, to kill the mood. And now, let's read Acts 15, 1 through 5. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. So four truths I want to show you today affirmed by the Jerusalem council. Number one, faith alone challenges our senses. Faith alone challenges our senses. As Paul and Barnabas are rejoicing in the success of the mission, um, these proponents of gospel plus Judaism wander up to Antioch. And apparently they've been teaching as they go. Verse 2 says they had no small dissension and debate. Now that's a Bible speak for they debated real hard. They went at it with Paul and Barnabas. Now imagine being Paul and Barnabas. I want you to go there in your mind, okay? You just risked your life. You just spent the last couple years traveling the world, teaching the gospel to Gentile areas where Christ had never been named. You see the power of God on display. You see lives changed, and you're back home celebrating the goodness of God. And some group comes from Judea, who probably hadn't been anywhere, and says, well, did you circumcise everybody? Did you teach them what foods to eat and not to eat, what clothes to wear, how to build synagogues and temples, where to make sacrifices, how to keep the festivals? And Paul and Barnabas probably say something like, no, we just told them about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and how to live a life that honors him. And the men say, well, you wasted your time. Everybody on that missionary journey you just preached to is lost and going to hell. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised and keep the law of Moses. If you were Paul and Barnabas and you just went through what you went through, how would you respond to somebody saying that to you? No small dissension and debate, maybe? And so their missionary sending church, Antioch, sends them again. Only this time it's a different kind of a missionary journey. It's back home, back to where the gospel started, back to Jerusalem, where all the big wigs of the early church were. All the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem would be there. All the Pharisees who had converted to Christianity were there. And this tells us, by the way, there were Pharisees that converted to Christianity in a significant number, which makes sense if you think about it. They, of all the Jewish parties that existed, they were the ones that accepted miracles and they accepted the supernatural and they believed the Bible. So that makes sense to us, but that shows you it happened. And the meeting agenda is set when they get there. Here's the meeting agenda. Here's what the whole council was about. When Gentiles trust in Christ, is it necessary to teach circumcision and law keeping as an equivalent requirement for salvation alongside faith. That's the meeting agenda. This is a big historic moment. I hope you realize the significance of this day in Bible history. I want you to see uh, this it, it is a day that could have turned things. Now, I believe God is sovereign, and I think this was going to happen, and he was going to preserve his church. But this day could have turned pretty dark because we even struggle today with the idea that we can be made right with God by faith alone. There's an inner condemnation that comes either from our sin nature, from our pride, or from Satan himself that says in multiple ways, you, you can't receive all the blessings and benefits of salvation just because God gave it to you. You got to earn that. It's like what Tom Hanks says at the end of Saving Private Ryan. Remember what he says to Matt Damon as he's kind of fading out there in the last scene of the movie? Don't pretend like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. At the very end of the movie, as he's kind of fading out, what are the two words he says? Earn this. Remember that? He says, earn this. Now, that scene makes sense to us. We get that. We are challenged by the idea that a gift such as our very salvation could be just given to us by grace where faith is only required. 
We can't understand it. We can't grasp it. And, and so we often try to humanize it and tame it because fallen minds understand this. Fallen minds understand, do this task and you will be saved. That makes complete sense to a fallen mind. Climb this mountain. Kiss this statue. Give to this charity. Bow five times a day facing this way. Keep these rituals. This makes sense to us because in the end, the fallen mind gets what it wants, which is to look in the mirror and say, congratulations, buddy, you did it. That's what the fallen mind wants. You see, works-based religion is everywhere. It's actually the default. You don't have to even search for it. Every other religion besides Protestant Christianity is completely based upon earning the favor of God by the right combination of works and actions. But here we stand with the apostles, with the reformers, simply, simply saying, trust in Jesus Christ by faith, and then obey him as a result of your faith. For it is by grace you are saved, by your faith, not of works, so that nobody can boast. Rather, it is a gift from God. Because you're God's workmanship, and you were created for good works. Not saved by good works, but saved for good works. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul said about these kind of things. You know, the natural person cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The ability to even comprehend that God Almighty would love you in an act of his grace by sending his son to die for you, the ability to even get that is a gift, to understand that is a gift. Grace is a gift. The ability to understand is a gift. The Spirit of God sent to us is a gift. He challenges our sensibilities to understand that we get everything based upon something Christ did for us. The world doesn't understand it. Pagans don't understand it. Tradition-based, works-based, Christian wannabes don't understand it because it's a gift from the Spirit of God. Faith alone challenges our sensibilities. It strips the credit from us and gives it to Christ. And that was the problem caused by the Jerusalem council to even have to meet. So that's the first truth we see affirmed. What's the second truth we see affirmed? Number two, we're going to see man's inability confirms our need. Man's inability confirms our need. We're going to keep reading. The problem has been raised. No debate's actually happened yet in the text. We'll see the debate now begin in verse 6 through 11 of chapter 15. Peter stands to make his case. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Good job, Peter. So, we first need to establish what Peter's talking about when he talks in verse 7 about the early days. I want you to go back in your mind, Acts 10, when I preached that many moons ago uh, in the message with Cornelius. The sheet descending, the animals rise, Peter, eat, kill. Remember that whole message? He's talking about that when Cornelius and all his men came to faith. He's drawing from experience that he had. And he says, I saw, Peter says, I saw Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit, and proceed to speak in different languages and praise God. They were clearly filled with the Holy Spirit. God truly saved them. And all they had when I preached to them was faith in Christ. I didn't tell them about circumcision or law. I just told them about Christ. God gave them the Spirit while I was talking. So, if you don't like it, you got to talk to God about it because he gave them the Spirit. So, Verse 6 through 9 really is his argument from experience. I saw it. God did it. I was there. 
But then verse 10 gets into a different matter. He says, I love this point. It's just a good point. Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? This is, you might call this the argument from inability. Obviously, this was a Jewish heavy crowd, so he makes a great point. Why would you ask Gentiles getting saved in Athens, Greece, to do something that Jews in Jerusalem have never been able to do since Moses gave the law 1,400 years ago? It's a pretty fair question, right? Peter saw this as like an initiation rite. This is like hazing the freshmen in the football team, you know, making them do things that you never had to do, but you make them feel like you had to do it. That's kind of what this is to Peter. Now, I want to be clear here. Peter's not denigrating the law. He calls it a yoke, not because it's immoral. It's not, but because it was a burden. He wasn't advocating for, you know, let them do whatever they want. You know, life, follow whatever path you want to. He wasn't saying that, but he, he was saying there are things that are not really moral in nature that are in the law that we don't need to make them keep needlessly, like circumcision or clothing with different fabrics or how curly your sideburns are or eating shellfish. It's not moral or immoral to do any of those things or not to do any of those things. But the opposing view said, no, no, those are all important. Every Gentile needs to do those things or they're not saved. And Peter, a Jewish man himself, pushed back and says, guys, we, we grew up with this stuff and we can't even keep it. How on earth can we ask Gentiles to do this? And, and it's that sentiment that I want to explore in verse 10. Peter says, the law is a yoke that Jews couldn't bear. It's an interesting phrase that they wanted to bear it. They tried to bear it. They wished they could do it. But that's not what Peter said. He said they were unable. They wanted to, but they couldn't. The law of God was an undefeated heavyweight opponent against every person who ever lived except Jesus Christ. Even the most pious person failed to make it out of round one without a TKO. So church, there is a key component to the gospel we see here in Peter's defense. Man's inability to save himself through living the right lifestyle is a powerful confirmation that we need grace. If nobody can save themselves through being the best version of themselves, even the most pious couldn't do it, then either two options, either nobody can be saved, and that's pretty dark, or only those who receive it by grace through faith can be saved. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is nobody righteous on this earth, not one. But Romans 5.8 says, of those same sinners that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, our inability to please God and earn God's favor is a pretty great stage for God to showcase his grace and mercy toward us. And that's exactly what he does in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin to save sinners. So you need to hear this. If you're out there thinking, you'll never be good enough to earn, to earn God's love. You'll never be good enough to make it on your own through behavior modification. Or I'll never be good for goodness sake. Or I'll never be able to follow the five pillars or the seven sacraments or the eightfold path or the 613 laws of Moses, let me tell you something. You are right. You'll never be good enough. No matter what Instagram tells you, you are actually not enough. Believing you can earn God's love with enough grit and grind, hashtag Memphis, is not a path to life. It's a path to defeat and death. It's a yoke that neither you or your fathers were able to bear. But verse 11, Peter says, we believe, though, we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. So if you're here, you're struggling with not being good enough for God to love you, not being worthy enough for Jesus to die for you. You know what? Go all in on that. That's where you are today. If you're sitting there thinking, man, I'm, I'm not even, I'm nobody. I, I'm dirty. I don't deserve the Son of God to die for me? Let me tell you something, you're right. 
You're not worthy. You are a sinner who cannot hulk yourself to glory. But the good news is once you've gotten down that low, you're in prime position to be saved by grace through faith. That's exactly who Jesus came to save. Sinners who know they're sinners and call out upon Christ for grace they know they can't earn. That's who receives grace. God opposes the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. Faith alone challenges our senses. Man's inability confirms our need for grace. The third truth revealed in the Jerusalem Council is this. Number three, the gospel calls all people. The gospel calls all people. Look with me to verses 12 through 18 of chapter 15. We're going to get a new voice in the story. Verse 12 says, And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnants of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. So, the gathering has heard from Barnabas and Paul, giving their experience on the mission field. They have heard from Peter the Apostle. And now James weighs in. This is James from the letter of James, the half-brother of Jesus. He had become a leading voice in the early church at Jerusalem, so he's speaking with authority here, almost as the final word. And what he does is connects an Old Testament prophecy to support what Peter has just said. So he's coming in to say, Peter's right, and here's why. That's what James is doing. The quotation he gives is from Amos 9. And honestly, there's probably a whole message that you could preach on the, the usage of the way he uses Amos uh, in his quotation. But what's important today is that James quotes Amos the prophet who was looking forward to a day when the tent of David would be rebuilt and nations would come to seek the Lord there. And James may have believed, as I do, that the rebuilt tent of David was not a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, was, but was rather the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, the Gentiles and nations prophesied coming to that rebuilt tent of David was happening before their eyes. That's his point. His point is it's happening. Look around you. It is happening. Gentiles are coming to inquire of the rebuilt tent of David that was once fallen. It's raised now. James is trying to say there is an Old Testament precedent for a mass inclusion of Gentiles. Saying, we knew this was going to happen, guys. What's this about? You read your Old Testament, right? We knew this was coming one day. Well, it, it's here. So they come to a powerful conclusion here. Not only was the gospel by faith alone, but the gospel was not just for Jews alone. The gospel was for anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord, and that means any kind of person with any kind of background. Is that still true today? You know, no, no one people or culture have a claim to the gospel. The gospel is not, as you might be told on the internet, a white man's religion. I hate hearing that. Far from it. Jesus was brown and Jewish. The gospel was born in the Middle East, immediately embraced by Greece and Rome and Northern Africa. Where do you think Alexandria was? Certainly the gospel had success in Europe and North America over the last few centuries. Praise God, we're here. But guess what? China and Sub-Saharan Africa are the big centers of Christianity right now. There are more black, Asian, and brown Christians today than there are white Christians. So Christianity is not now and has never been linked to a skin color or a demographic of people. The wealthy, the poor, the educated, the uneducated, everyone in between needs the gospel because sin affects everyone equally. And because grace is grace and faith is faith, your money or your education or your skin color can neither help you nor hurt you when it comes to standing before God. 
Our culture is fixated on black, white, and brown right now because it helps distract from the fact that our greatest need is for our sins, which are scarlet, to be made white as snow. Would the gospel be available to all peoples and cultures? They were at a pivotal moment here in the early church. A lot hung in the balance. A lot could have made Christianity unrecognizable if this meeting went a different way. They could focus on the differences between Jew and Gentile Christians and make it an issue for generations to come, or they could keep the focus on the gospel and the individual removal of sin. They could have made Christianity a a sect of Judaism, or they could have unleashed the grace of Jesus Christ upon the world, and praise God, they did the latter. So we've seen three truths so far. Faith alone changes our senses. Man's inability confirms the need for grace. Number three, the gospel calls all people And lastly, number four, fellowship is a consideration in the body of Christ. Fellowship is a consideration in the body of Christ. And I'll show you where that comes from. We're going to continue reading in verse 19. We get the verdict. Here comes the answer. They're they're going to render the verdict here. And we're going to get some marching orders from James about going forward. What do we do? Verse 19. Therefore, James says... My judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay, James hits the conclusion of the council here. First of all, when he says, when we will not trouble them, he means The proposition that a Gentile must be circumcised and keep the law failed. That's what he means. So that vote, uh, and to use Robert's rules of order, did not pass, okay? So the next question you're probably wondering is this. Why did he then give those four specific things not to do? Isn't that kind of like having a four commandments rather than a 10 or a 613? What's up with that? Why would James feel it necessary to mention specifically things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, things strangled, and things with blood in it. So the answer to that question tells us a lot about the priorities of the early church. The reason for these four encouragements that are mentioned is because they were the top concerns for a Jewish person engaging in fellowship with a Gentile, specifically table fellowship over a meal. So think about what James was doing. He basically knew that the Pharisaic-minded Jewish Christians lost, all right? So the Pharisee Christians lost this day. They did. But rather than spike the football or dance upon their theological graves, he wants to ask the other side, the winners, to make a concession to the losers, a sacrifice on their behalf. And he asks the Gentile converts, do not eat food that's been attached to idols or be involved in sexual practices at temples. Do not eat food that was prepared in a way that was either strangled or raw that would have lots of blood still in it that would be offensive to Jews. That's what he says. Now, why would he say this? Because Jewish Christians still had a lot of the old traditions. You're only 15, 20 years out from the uh, death of Jesus. So you're, you're not far enough away for traditions to dissolve, okay? Okay. So you have a lot of Christians that still have that Jewish mentality because they were converted out of Judaism. So James asked the Gentiles coming into the faith new today, please be mindful of what a Jewish person might consider a defilement that would affect your ability to fellowship together, especially, especially at communion. He wanted the winners to be mindful of their weaker brothers. So what's the lesson here? It's a really good lesson in that statement from James. The lesson is Christian maturity is to make sacrifices for your brothers and sisters in the name of unity and fellowship. Practical examples. You know I I don't preach from the King James Version of the Bible. I don't even really read it recreationally. But you know what I'm not going to do? Go to our senior adults who have grown up with it and memorized from it and tell them, 
hey, new pastor in town, I need you to get a new Bible to go along with what I preach from. I'm not going to do that. Guess what? I know some people love modern worship music. I know some people love traditional hymns. And it's really hard. But you know what? We sacrifice for one another. It is not worth splitting up over. You know what I think God probably dislikes more than churches that split over doctrinal differences is that churches that split over stylistic differences. What a terrible reason to split your church. When you have a multi-generational church like we do, you do things to show each other you want them here with you. You take a loss once in a while. You let things go rather than demand your way all the time. Young people in my demographic, 20s, 30s, 40s, I hope you can agree with me here. I would rather have senior adults and grandparents in my church than have the loudest, hippest, most modern church we could have. Amen? To my 60s and up friends, I hope you can agree with me. I'd rather have new life and young families and crying babies and spilled $6 lattes as opposed to a dying church that's spick and span where there's more funerals than babies born. Amen? So sometimes, the point, broad fellowship requires sacrifice for one another. And in the end, it's always worth it. Church, church culture is a lot like the world today drifting towards splitting everything up in preference groups. The millennial church down the road. The boomer church down the road. The traditional hymns only, KJV only church down the road. Everybody gets their own way, everybody's happy, nobody has to lay aside their preferences, and it looks just like the world. But blessed is the church where everyone gives up their preferences for one another. Blessed is the church where preferences don't drive the train, and you're so excited to just hear the unvarnished truth from the Word of God, all those other trappings don't even factor into your decision. That's a mature church, willing to place such a high value on corporate fellowship that you would make sacrifices for each other and not demand your way or the highway. That's what James asked the Gentiles to do. It's what he asked the Jewish Pharisees who lost to do. Listen to the wisdom of James. Nobody wants a split between Gentile and Jewish Christians, James says. So Gentiles, listen, don't make the Jews have to eat the pork tartare or the blood pudding, okay? Can we do that? Don't go get your meal half-priced at the temple of Zeus after it's been sacrificed and serve it to your Pharisee friend, okay? Can we do that? I think we can. So we've learned about grace in several ways. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around grace because it goes against our sensibilities that we gotta earn everything we get. It hurts our pride to think that we're unable to make it on our own, to make God give us salvation when we do the right combo of behaviors. That all people need the grace of God, not just those who are like me or aren't like me, but all people equally need the gospel. That we are to show grace to one another in the ways that we fellowship with one another and interact. So I hope you appreciate the Word of God today, always maintaining that it only hurts when you add to the gospel. The beauty of grace and faith is that they are the most beautiful when they are alone. Sola fide, sola gratia. May these remind us that we serve a God who poured out His love on us when we least deserved it so that we could see how much he truly loved us. Let's pray.